Jason's reign of terror is over. Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you're having a good one. Uh, I'm Nick and today I'm continuing my Friday the 13th review series with part 4, the final chapter. Well, it's not really the final chapter, but it was at the time. Uh, I am not alone in this review series. Go check out Good Real Hunting's channel, uh, Filthy Dan's Film Discussion, Moser Movie Reviews, and Review and Rankings with Robbie Sobel. They are all putting out reviews at the same on the same day as mine, every Friday, all the way up to August. Links will be in the description, guys. Go show them some love. And also, head on over to House of the Living Dead's channel, which will also be in the description, because they're doing watch-alongs. To the same films we're reviewing every uh, every Friday so Friday night you'll get some Friday the 13th action over there so go uh, support them as well now I know this is a fan favorite in the series and for good reason so without wasting any more time let's get into this bad boy so Friday the 13th part 4 the final chapter was released in 1984 and stars Kimberly Beck Corey Feldman and you got Crispin Glover in there as well and it's directed by Joseph Zito now, like I was saying in my intro, guys, this is the final chapter. It, at the time, it was meant to kill off Jason and wrap up this franchise. But, you know, when you make money, you want to keep making money. So, that's why we got 12 movies in this franchise. But for today, we're just going to talk about the 1984 classic, The Final Chapter. So, essentially, this film takes what we got from the first three movies... It pretty much does it better. It improves on almost every aspect. There's no denying that this is one of the best slashers out there. Uh, great likable characters for the most part. Uh, great kills. Great atmosphere. This one pretty much got it all. And it's all done at a fairly high level. So this film takes place right after part 3. Just like part 2. So these are all back to back. We get uh, Jason still lying in the barn, the ambulance and that showing up. And we get these really cool like crane shots and helicopter shots where that we never really seen before in this franchise. Like you really start to notice the budget at this point. So yet again, we are still in the year 1985. But like I keep telling you guys, don't forget that it's going to get messy real soon. Of course, we can't get into the intro before we do a little recap of all the previous films and how we got here. Even though if you're watching Part 4 of Friday the 13th, you probably know what's going on. But just in case you didn't, there's three minutes of recap at the starting of this. And like I said in the review, guys, it doesn't bother me so much unless I'm marathoning these. Then you really start to feel the recaps, and I usually fast forward them. So they end up taking Jason down to the morgue. And of course, we all know this is a Friday 13th movie. He ain't really dead. He is, he's going to come back with a vengeance. And uh, he does. Uh, we get this mortician, or whatever you would call him, named Axel. Who is just this real sleazeball of a, of a man. He, he wants nothing but sex and to be fooling around with the nurses and that. So Axel is stuck watching his uh, smut like aerobics videos <laughs> on the TV like classic 80s and uh, he ends up getting one of the coolest kills in the whole franchise personally it's my number one if you've seen my uh, top 10 kills video he essentially gets his throat like it's, he starts sawing into his throat with the surgical saw and like halfway through he starts twisting his head and you can see the skin and like fold in that and it's like as if you took a towel and ranged it. Like that's his neck. And it's, oof. Looks great. And that's one thing about this movie. All of the on-screen kills are done pretty damn brutally and effectively. And right off the bat, the movie's saying we do not mess around with this and the nurse's kill as well. She gets put up against the wall and he sticks a knife in her like uh, chest area kind of. And just brings it down all the way down her belly. And it's like oof. It's just you can really tell Tom Savini came back for this one because it is brutal, man. The first movie, we got like two or three brutal kills with the decapitation and Kevin Bacon and Marcy. But this one, even the no-names are getting sweet deaths. And uh, yeah, this is a masterpiece in the special, not special effects, but the practical effects department. So then Jason books out of there and heads on back to the lake, picking off 
hitchhikers and such on the way. So then we get introduced to the Jarvis family who lives right off of the lake. Uh, what a great fam. Like, we never really had a family in Friday the 13th thus far. It's just been these, like, horny counselors or teenagers going out in the in the woods by a lake. But this time we actually get a family uh, dynamic in here with the mom, the son, and daughter. They're, they all seem like they love each other and caring. And it's just nice to see because in so many of these horror movies... There's always like an abusive parent or whatnot going on in the family, which is understandable. It works for most of the plots, but it is nice just to see just a happy-go-lucky family. Trish is your typical nice girl, like the girl next door kind of thing, that wears a, likes to wear men's tops and just wear a belt around them and wear them like a dress. <laughs> that seems to happen a couple times in the film with her. But yeah, she, she's cute and she's nice. And you got her brother Tommy Jarvis, which uh, he's an interesting character. He's right into making these masks and uh, like Halloween masks and stuff, which is uh, I think just like a nod to Tom Savini. He's also kind of like a, a computer geek, a nerd playing video games all the time and stuff like that. Aside from the Jarvis family, we also get a group of teens that rented the, the guest house or whatever next door. Out of the six in the group, I think that Jimbo and Teddy are the standouts here, the most memorable. Uh, Teddy's kind of crazy, always putting Jimbo down in the sex life and stuff. And he's kind of a joker. And Jimbo's more like self-conscious and um, uh, he's less out there, we'll just say that. But uh, once once people get to know him, he's pretty crazy if, if you've ever seen his dance moves. Aside from all those characters, they also throw in two twins on bicycles who live nearby. They end up showing up the party. Uh, we get this hunt this guy who claims to be a hunter who the Jarvis uh, family runs into, at least Trish and Tommy. And he claims, yeah, he's hunting bear. And they're like, huh, it's not bear season and different stuff like that. And you soon find out that uh, he's really out there to get vengeance on Jason. And, you know, before Jason starts picking them off, it really feels like uh, an 80s, like, sex comedy. Or, or like Porky's or like you know how the 80s had so many of these uh, like sex comedies like how they got kind of revived in the early 2000s with like American Pie and stuff like that but the 80s was a big time for that too and I feel like this movie could kind of slip into that category if you remove the horror from it but once Jason shows up he starts picking them off one by one like he does and Jason in this movie it looks pretty badass as well like part three He's a little less big, but he's still a pretty big guy. Uh, I always found he had like trollish features or like Goonies features or something. I don't know if it's his ears or what. It, they're sticking out a little more than in part three. But that part, was well, eh, I, I don't hate it or anything. It just always kind of looked weird to me. And his mask is basically the same. You get the axe marks, but uh, his chevrons are a little different. Like he's missing some. But yeah, he's menacing as hell. He runs right at people and stuff. So just like part three, they kept that menacing tone. And them kills. Oh my god, are they ever great. I already mentioned Axel's and the nurses at the first, which were both great. And yeah, most of these are amazing. And it's because they show you just enough carnage. Like a lot of the other films, they cut it right before we got to see more. This one shows you the perfect amount. For, uh, to not overdo it, but yeah, it's just right. The perfect amount of carnage time. We do still get a few off-screen kills, but for the most part, even they're done pretty good. Yeah, one of my favorites in this film is Jimbo's death. Uh, this also was in my top 10 kills in the franchise. It was my number two. So my number one was Axel, and number two Jimbo, both from this movie, which just goes to show you the amount of great kills in here. Yeah, he's yelling, where's the corkscrew a bunch of times at Teddy. Eventually t getting the corkscrew in the hand and turning to get the meat cleaver right in his face. And it's like, oh my god. And the way they show it, it looks great with his, screw with his like yell at the same time. And if you know how they filmed that, they actually filmed that in reverse. That, that was already in his face and they had to haul it out, which is uh, interesting to know. Another great kill in this film is uh, Pretty Boy Doug in the shower when he's singing right after uh, having sex with Sarah, I believe her name is. He thinks it's her outside of the shower, but it's Jason. And Jason just goes right through the shower, putting his, uh, like, crushing the guy's face against the wall. And you hear that crunch and that, like, smushes the guy's whole, like, front face. 
and it looks great. You feel the bones cracking in that and the blood looks amazing. And they even cut that kill a bit because uh, Joseph Zito found it was too much. And one of the off-screen kills that's really unique to me is where one of the, I think the twins, one of the twins gets killed, but it's seen through the shadow of the on the house, which uh, where we don't get to see the kill, but we can kind of see it through the shadow, which I thought was very clever as well, if you're gonna do an off-screen kill. Not to say that this movie doesn't have any stinker kills as well. For me, there's two, not so much stinker, but I have problems with them. One is Samantha, who dies in the raft outside. She gets the, the knife, like, right through her, like, through her back, like, out here. But the thing is, she's making, like, these weird noises in her face. It's like, eh, eh, eh. And it's like, <laughs> it just looks so corny. But I understand the water was freezing cold at the time of filming. And she, the girl almost died of, like, hypothermia or whatever. So it's understandable. It just, the finished product didn't turn out that great, in my opinion. And the second death that's their kill that's kind of funky to me is Rob. So when he's in the basement and he gets attacked by Jason and it doesn't really seem like he's trying to defend himself at all. He's like getting beat by with hammers and stuff and he's just yelling, he's killing me, he's killing me, oh my god, he's killing me. And it's just like so long of that going on I'm like, no one, I don't think anybody yells that oh while they're dying, he's killing me, like... <laughs> I can, I can understand people are yelling or you're in pain or yelling something else out, but just yelling he's killing me out, it, it kind of added in a little bit of comedy there where the the scene is actually very serious though, so it's kind of contradicting. And I, that one just never sat right for me. It's more funny than it is scary. And also the mom could have had a better death or at least a better reveal. Uh, I know there was a deleted ending off of this where an alternate ending where she was like in the bathtub or some shit, which would have been really cool because she was like a pretty big character with the family and this, the way she dies is, I don't know. But guys, these are just nitpicks. Like I'm not going to dock a bunch of points off the movie for just a couple little nitpicks I have. So don't yell at me in the comments. Again, these are just my opinions. <laughs> But uh, I do believe there's an editing error too within these kills. It could be just me or maybe that was the plan of the director. But to me, it's really weird because you get Jimbo's death where he kill gets killed in the kitchen. Then we go upstairs to where Jason hauls the girl out of the window and shoots her down onto the car below. But then the next time we see Jason, he's like right beside Jimbo again, grabbing the knife to kill Teddy in the living room back in the kitchen there. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure that was supposed to come right after Jimbo's death and go and kill Teddy. Cause why would he be there then outside on the second floor, then back in the kitchen. And it just feels like an editing error. Like they, they placed the wrong scenes when they were editing the movie in the wrong place. Maybe it was uh, on purpose. Maybe they just didn't want those two kills to be side by side. That's why they split them. But it really feels like it's supposed to be that way. Just because, like I said, he's in the kitchen, then he's upstairs, and he's in the kitchen again. It's like, it just feels like, like, they fucked up. <laughs> so by this point in the movie, all of the next door neighbors are all dead. All the, the people went to the guest house. So we're just stuck with the Jarvis family, with only Trish and Tommy left, actually. They go back home, nobody's there, can't find their mom, power's out, everything like that. So Trish and Rob head over to the house next door and find out that everyone's missing over there and dead. And they get this really weird scene too where Gordon, their dog, the family dog, he runs in the house and he must sense Jason or something. He runs upstairs and jumps out the window. It's the last you ever see of him again. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's kind of weird. I, like, I understand maybe he could sense that uh, danger was around or something like that because he's a dog, but to run upstairs and jump out the window like that was kind of weird to me. And we never do find out what happened to Gordon. Maybe he was just out there looking for his girlfriend. We get Rob's death in the basement of that house, which leads us to our final girl's circuit with uh, Jason, final girl Trish, and we also get final boy Tommy in this one. And Trish goes in the full survival mode. And this is what I was saying about her care about her family and her and her home. She runs back, board up the door right away, locks all the windows and shit, tells Tommy to stay away. 
And it's this is from here on out the movie is epic. Next thing you know, Jason grabs Tommy through the window. Trish has to beat him on the head with a hammer to let him make him let him go. Get a bit of running and hiding from Jason uh, until he gets a TV smashed over his head and shit. And this is where Trish makes the decision of letting sacrificing herself pretty much, letting Jason run after him instead of Tommy, so Tommy can save himself. Too bad Tommy didn't listen because she leaves and comes all the way back and he's still in the house. But he has a plan. This all leads to Jason about to kill Trish. We ultimately get Tommy coming down the stairs with his head all shaved and shit. He got patches trying to look like a young Jason. And it kind of, it works. He's trying to trick him, do some child psychology shit like Ginny did in part two. And it gets him to turn around, not kill his sister and go towards him. This all leads to Trish knocking off of his mask with the machete, pissing him off, revealing his face, turning around back to Trish only for Tommy to come up with the machete and get him right in the head. And it's not an instant kill. He turns, falls, and lands on it and it goes all the way through his head with all that glorious gore and it looks amazing. This was supposed to be the true death of Jason and it really shows. He's not quite out for the count though. When he's laying there, Tommy spots his fingers moving. So he keeps going at it, whacking and whacking with the machete. We don't get to see. We just see Tommy's face. And he's just not stopping, yelling, die, die. And the movie wraps up with Trish and Tommy in the hospital. And when Trish is giving Tommy a hug, you can see crazy in Tommy's eyes. And it leaves it open for a possible sequel, like with Tommy being a killer or going crazy or something along those lines. I mean, which would make sense. I mean, a kid that age going through something this traumatizing, you know? And really that ending, it was great considering that the last three movies were really just like copying each other. Like with the jump scare and the dream sequence at the end. I'm kind of glad that didn't happen in this because it would have been way overdone. And it was a smart move on their part to, to just end the way they did. And that's basically it in Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter. This is definitely one of the higher quality films in this franchise. I had a few nitpicks along the way, but nothing that really could hurt this film's glory to me. If I had to slap a rating on this film, I was, I'm going to have to give it a 9 out of 10. It's an amazing uh, film in general, and it's a great, phenomenal slasher. If you're just talking about slashers, this is a 10 out of 10. Basing this out of all films, I'm giving this a 9, which is great. I haven't given too many 10s out in my life, so consider this uh, a great movie. Just a really fun time with some great kills, great great characters, great setting, uh, pretty much all the above. So there you have it, guys. I know this is a fan favorite, so let me know down below if this is your favorite or where does it rank in the series for you. Also, be sure to go check out everybody else's reviews that dropped the same day as mine. Like I said, links will be down in the description, guys. And uh, that's all I got for you guys today. I'll be back with part five next Friday. That should be uh, pretty damn interesting to talk about, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.